Welcome to HeavyBit and to our panel on building developer relations teams. Um, really excited to be here with this uh, awesome, illustrious panel of uh, DevRel professionals. My name is Justin. I am the director of developer relations at a company called StackPath. Um, before that, I did developer relations at a company called Keen.io. To my immediate left, I have uh, Jade Wang. She's uh, developer relations lead at <laughs> Cloudflare. Sorry. Thank you. Um, formerly uh, did DevRel at Meteor, uh, was the founder of ShareJJ, Sandstorm.io. To her left, we have uh, Bear. Developer advocacy lead at Slack, a small chat company. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of Slack. I heard of them. You've heard of Slack? Okay, okay cool. Um, Once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, formerly working DevRel at uh, Twitter and Facebook. Um, and to her left, we have uh, Tim Falls. He's the VP of Community and Social Impact at Nexosis, formerly working at Techstars, SendGrid, and was a colleague of mine at Keen.io. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd kick off uh, the panel by having each of you talk really briefly about how you got into developer relations. Prior to my time at Meteor, um, I had uh, started a startup on my own. Um, and basically, we were iterating on various ideas. And we started building out our product ideas with Ruby on Rails. And then Meteor had a launch. And we were able to iterate on our ideas much more quickly and build out new features more quickly. Our product ideas didn't end up working out, but we were able to iterate on them much more quickly because of the existence of Meteor. And there was a meetup at which I told Jeff this story. And he was like, yeah, you should tell this story to more people. Come join Meteor. It's <laughs> <laughs> awesome. After graduating, I was at a couple of startups. I think four in two years that all kind of pivoted me out of a job or crumbled under my feet. But the last one was a company called Strobe, where we were doing a lot of work on an open source project called Sprout Core, which is now Ember.js. Um, and as part of my role there, you know, tiny startup, you wear a lot of hats. Um, I started out in product marketing, but the work that I was doing was what we would really call DevRel, which was a lot of content writing. It was um, prepping talks for meetups. It was making sure that we grew our community. And then um, when I moved on to Facebook, I transitioned full time into DevRel as DevRel, which was a lot of writing tech docs, a lot of going out and giving talks, and um, yeah, trying to build a community for the Facebook SDKs and Parse. I similarly stumbled into this role of developer relations. I was a sixth employee at SendGrid when they first started and joined as a marketing, the, the first marketing team member. And about eight months later when I hired my boss, who was the new director of marketing, and he kind of took all my responsibilities. We were searching for a, a my, new <coughs> my new path within the company, and uh, he kind of observed my activity and uh, interactions at South By, which was our first conference together, he and I. And uh, at the same time, we were co-working with Twilio, uh, Twilio's first developer evangelist, John Sheehan. He was sharing our office, and they were just getting their program, program off the ground. So that was my first introduction to developer relations and evangelism, what that even was. And because Twilio and SendGrid were so similar in their, um, their products and their business model and their target market of developers, uh, and they were seeing success with that program, we decided to copy them. And uh, <laughs> we, we collaborated a lot with them and, and became uh, pretty close partners. But uh, yeah. Just kind of, I was the person that was available with time and energy and uh, passion to to take forward that program, and so I did. Yeah, I, I kind of um, also fell into it, and that's why I asked this question. I think it's a good primer for for the 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 discussion that we're going to have about um, you know hiring your first evangelist or advocate or DevRel person or whatever you want to call it, um, because I, I I hear this story a lot from. Uh, people that have been doing this for a while, mm -hmm. and now we're the operators that are actually building teams. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting that you know startups are thinking earlier on, and it's not something that they kind of fall into. It's like this is something that they're going to do intentionally. I'm actually curious to ask the, for a show of hands. Like, sure. how many people are uh, thinking about making a first DevRel hire? Cool. And how many Thank people you. are currently working a DevRel role? All right. Cool. 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 Good idea. Yeah. 
That was awesome to see everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can't actually see you. Yeah, yeah it, it seemed like about a third of the people are thinking about hiring, it, making their first rel, DevRel hire, and mm -hmm. uh, a little bit higher than that are currently in DevRel. Yeah. And there yeah. was a significant amount of overlap between the two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Interesting thing, too, is that w t in talking to all of us, we kind of fell into the role. But um, I know that I had an intern this summer who had had previous DevRel experience in an internship. And so we're seeing more and mm. more people who are coming out of college and seeing this as a viable mm. career path. Right. So you can hire people who have however many years DevRel experience. You don't mm -hmm. need to pivot people who have been doing one thing and, and kind of switch them into a new role. It's still mm -hmm. a great way to go when you're looking for your first DevRel hire. But I think that picture is going to change with people coming mm -hmm. out of college, which is kind of cool. Yeah, it's very cool. My first question is just, you know, what like what are what are some what are some signs? Like when do you when do you know you're ready to hire your first full-time uh, DevRel person um, as, a, as a startup operator? Well, if you're a, I mean, I'll start. If you're a startup founder and like one of the founders has been basically overloaded with tasks that are normally considered DevRel, um, maybe it's time to start delegating. <laughs> um, and, and also if you have a lot of clarity around uh, mm -hmm. what the role entails, uh, what the tasks are and what the goals are. Like y you should have some clarity around what it is that you want out of your DevRel program because that actually is very different between the, like from company to company. Yeah, and I think once you have that clarity, hopefully you will be able to project a few months into the future because hiring DevRelers takes a, a good long time. Mm -hmm. So if you're see thinking that, oh, I need somebody in two months, you're kind of behind schedule already and starting to source them. Um, and definitely there are things that you can do within whatever existing team you have between engineering and marketing to sort of shore up the gaps in the meantime. But often um, I've talked to companies who are interested in hiring their first DevRel person and already they're doing a bunch of DevRel activities, but it hasn't really been formalized into a program. So there, there are ways and means to get around what you need to do before you make your first DevRel hire, but ideally you're projecting, say, six months down the line. Yeah. I think the only thing I would add to those points, uh, <clears throat> which I agree with, is to make sure you know why you are ready or <laughs> why you are going to do this and invest money and time and, and other resources into it. Uh, one thing that I've observed in um, earlier this year, up until the last uh, last week actually, I've been consulting with multiple different companies and in the course of talking to lots of people who um, were potential clients, I found that sometimes people, companies, believe that they should have, quote unquote, should have DevRel, um, but they're not really sure why. And they're really just going in that direction because they see other people in the industry doing it or their competitors doing it. Um, but it's not necessary for all companies or all products or all platforms. Um, and I think just having a very the, the clarity of mm -hmm. like, why are we doing this? And why are we, because it's a lot, right? You can spend a lot of money and a lot of time um, investing and building out one of these programs. So to, to be sure of the why is, is the first step, I think. I mean, to add to that, um, having that clarity also helps you define what success looks like for the program. Mm -hmm. So if you know what you're looking to get out of it, then you know if you've gotten it. Do you have an opinion on whether you hire like a senior DevRel person that's kind of like build out the vision or, or, or just an, someone that's going to execute early on? Have you seen better success one way or the other? I think it really mm -hmm. depends on your team and where the strengths and weaknesses are. Like if what you're really missing in your DevRel program is somebody who's going to bring structure to the whole thing and create a vision for what developer relations looks like, absolutely you should be looking for a senior hire. But if you already have somebody who is holding down the fort and they need execution help while you have a longer term search for that mm -hmm. person. because when you hire the person who's going to be setting your vision for DevRel, you want to take your time because that person is going to have a huge impact on your developer brand and the way people think about you in market, um, how your docs look. So there's nothing wrong with making interim, more junior hires if you've got leadership to shore up the gaps in between. I think it depends on your team. Being clear on where you are right now, right? And, and, and how, how much confidence you have in it. So sometimes you might need more exploration in order to be, achieve that clarity and, and reach, 
reach a point where you're confident and you're ready to really put more resources into it. So making a more junior hire that can do that like low level exploration and kind of start testing the waters might be a good thing before going full on and hiring a, a, a senior executive. I'm, I'm curious if you all have any like uh, uh, advice for how to, how to find the, the more junior hire if that's the road you're going down. Like, uh, you know, someone that's going to be the kind of vision caster has probably done it before somewhere and, mm -hmm. and has like a, a bit of a whatever they have a resume, what you can look at first. Mm -hmm. Is there like a archetype or, or, a, or like a, a personality yeah. type that you found is, is more successful in general just for people? I mean, uh, I can offer some suggestions. What, um, and this is actually a good method for uh, finding both junior and more senior people, but. Um, if you, if you have some rabid fans of your developer product, right, they are already super excited and they have a lot of familiarity with your product. Um, if, you like, if you find that subset of people and find the subset within all of those people who are very qualified to do DevRel work for your company, then you will probably find either a junior or possibly a more senior person if you, um, in that group. Mm -hmm. So like it's it may be a smaller pond to fish in, but they already have familiarity with your product and they already are super excited about it. Um, so that's a good that's a good place to look. And if in that pool some of them already have a lot of DevRel experience, then you are in luck. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think the, your community is the first place to look, um, and if they're not there then looking at universities and, and you know you mentioned how people are coming out of college and, and seeing that developer relations is a thing and a, and a career path option. Um, I think one of the, that is a result of a lot of college hackathons and the emergence of yeah. college hackathons and what Major League Hacking has facilitated mm -hmm. and like so many companies are sending developer relations professionals to these hackathons so uh, students are seeing what it is firsthand and they're experiencing the impact of it on them, and so they're excited about it. And uh, mm -hmm. I think those are pretty low barrier to entry in terms of events mm -hmm. to go to, and you don't have to be a developer evangelist to go to a, a college hackathon and, and see what's going on. Um, and so that, that's an, mm -hmm. another really good place to explore, I think. I wanted to add something to that. Um, if you have someone from your company currently who is either on the recruiting team or marketing team or you know whoever is currently sort of halfway doing the DevRel role, um, the, the students who are currently the organizers for the hackathons or mm -hmm. the organizers of the career fair, yeah. uh, if you work with them in your capacity as a company, you get a good sense of their communication style, whether they are on the ball, whether they like have their ducks in a row, and that becomes a good sourcing mechanism. Yeah. Basically, the students who are organizing the career fairs in the hackathon are often good candidates for DevRel. Yeah. In terms of archetypes or personalities or other habits that you might observe within people, um, entrepreneurialism is, yes. I would say, the number one thing mm -hmm. for me. Um, because developer relations is, is that, right? It's very self-driven. Um, you're out in working independently a lot. and. Uh, and I say that also, I guess, anecdotally from all the folks that I've hired, there's been a lot of, a heavy percentage of those people have run their own businesses, tried their own startups, and just generally had a, an entrepreneurial um, vibe to them. Mm -hmm. I was looking to see if people were TAs in undergrad, mm -hmm. uh, honestly, for anything, okay. but particularly yeah. for computer science, because that means that they've got a clarity of communication style that they've not only been selected for at some point by some professor, but they've honed over time because they get mm -hmm. feedback from their students. So it's not like, I gave a talk this one time, I'm a great communicator. It's I had to deliver content on a regular cadence, I had yeah. to prep for these classes, I had to show up and uh, be engaged and engaging on a regular basis. Be very structured. Oh yeah, about it. teaching yeah. experience is so, yeah. is so great. Yeah. Yeah. The and the things that that practices and develops in oneself is responsibility and accountability, which is also very important because because of yeah. that independent work style and, and nature of the work. Oh, another great place to uh, to start poaching or fishing for recruits, uh, code boot camps, teachers. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Or graduates. Yeah. Yeah. And I found that. Um, a lot of people now are seeing developer relations as a potential like career pivot. So people who are doing product marketing or product management or 
uh, data science or different things where, that are kind of adjacent to engineering or to developer relations, uh, mm -hmm. I think are a good, good, good place to, to look to. Audience member gets uh, contacted by these, these uh, college hackathon organizers and is wondering if there's a better quality out of, out of certain ones in, in our experience. There's a huge yeah. spectrum of, yeah. Yeah, like, th there's a very widespread. Mm -hmm. um, I think my, my litmus is, are they involved in major league hacking? And then, uh, because they're kind of like the NCAA, if you will, of college hackathons. <laughs> and they work with those organizers very closely, um, but some of them they've been working with for two or three years now that they've, that they've been around that long, and some of them they haven't, right? And also those student organizers turn over, obviously. Um, yeah. Different universities have different reputations. Um, I can't really say which ones are the best, um, but but uh, I always lean on, on my friends at MLH <laughs> for that. So I could definitely yeah. put you in touch with them. And, and uh, there's uh, uh, there's a good proxy you can ask the organizers for, which is um, of the participants from last year, uh, what percentage of the projects were actually finished, and um, can I see uh, what the winning projects were? And so based on that, you can say, okay, like I. I went, I went to this project, it's still working, right? And like you play around with it, oh, it's terribly buggy as you might expect a hackathon project to be, but like, uh, but the concept is there. Um, you also wanna have some clarity as to what it is that you wanna get out of the hackathon as a sponsor, right? Is it feedback to your docs? Because if, you uh, if you have a lower bar <laughs> um, in terms of the if the participants are more novice, um, they might actually give you very valuable feedback um, because they will get stuck on easier things and that will give you more information on how to improve your documentation. Any anti-patterns? We talked about like where to find people and is, is there like a- Anti-patterns in finding like people or anti-patterns in hackathons? Red flags like, oh, you're, oh. You're, you're, you want to get into DevRel, but that doesn't seem like a fit. It's Usually it comes out in conversation, but often one thing that I do find with people who organize <laughs> hackathons as their main gig is that they think that that is the totality of DevRel, and that's mm -hmm. not true. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot of other work that we do when it comes to scaled content, when it comes to working directly one-on-one -on -one with partners, and you might get people whose vision of the role is that they get to bounce around the world going to hackathon after hackathon every weekend. Um, and if people are really sold on that as a vision of what they want to do, sometimes it can feel like a bait and switch when you bring them in the door. So getting clarity with them early on on whether that's what they think that they're doing is Expectation important. setting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Plus one. <laughs> <laughs> you should have re what, react you for this <laughs> conversation. Yeah. You don't just give them the MX gold and say, go, go to the hackathon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or like, go give talks, right? I mean, like, yeah. sometimes it's important to sort of rethink what your ROI for conference talks versus hackathon versus blog posts and like how you balance between these things. And sometimes strategically, it's more useful for your, the, you know, the success of your company or your product to uh, invest more in some than others. And if the hire has a different expectation of like, oh, I thought I was just gonna be traveling all the time and not spend a lot of time writing, then that's gonna, you know, if the, they have to be willing to do whatever is necessary for the success of the program as opposed to what they, you know, a glamorous lifestyle or something like that. Yeah, that, that actually is a, is a great segue into one of the other things I want to talk about, which is, um, you know, you're just starting this program. Let's say you've actually hired someone, you found your mm -hmm. person. Um, well, like, what do you measure? Is, is it, how do, you, how do you get started with, like, actually showing the value of your, of your investment and the, the work of the person? Um, it depends how from the bottom you're starting, right? Like, okay. take stock of what you've got. Do you have a dev site? Do you have good documentation? That's always step one. Do you have um, places where people can find you online, whether that's on Twitter, whether you have a uh, presence on Stack Overflow or on some other forum site? Can people reach you? Um, what happens when they reach you? Do you need to shore up any gaps there? Often you find in earlier stage startups, the, the DevRel portion, like there's so much ground up work to be done that measuring it is almost secondary because you can just say this is a given good that you, that you need to build this stuff up hey, before look, you start measuring. It's now obvious we, that we you need to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like obviously <laughs> that you need to like brush your teeth, there's like basic hygiene, and yeah. then yeah, there's okay. like building on top of that. Yeah. yeah. Mostly the 
accountability question comes into play when you start spending money. Mm. So if you bring people in and you're being productive and you're, you're building up the website, you can show increased traffic, you can show increased adoption, more um, API tokens are being created, whatever it is. That's sort of just unquestionably helpful. But if you say, all right, now I want $20,000 to run this community program, that's when you have to start thinking about, all right, well, how are we going to measure it? Do I need to convince somebody that there has to be direct ROI? And is, is that ROI, you know, attendees? Is it the amount of people that we touched and for how long? Um, are we gonna have any way to track whether people who showed up to our event are more likely to come back to our, our developer site? And I think setting expectations early about what is possible to measure and also what those measurements are really telling you is important. So mm -hmm. there's no one hard and fast rule. That's kind of a, a meta answer. Yeah, I think I agree with like that, that, that foundations up front, you know, where are you in the laying the foundation? and at that stage, you're just kind of, it's binary, like do you have it or do you not? And if you don't, then, and, and it's on a basic checklist, like do you have docs, do you have somewhere that they can interact with one another and, and solve problems? Um, so that's the first stage, then once you're beyond that, I think having that clarity of what is the primary mission and objective of this community and of this program, um, you know, there's, there's lots of different things I mean, the DevRel program is probably going to have lots of different missions, but when it comes to measuring, having one primary thing, one primary objective, like this community is going to be about um, support, right? We're going to build a developer, developer relations program to really foster a community f to enable uh, developers to help one another and to take workload off our support team because it's overloaded or because we don't have those people or whatever. Another, another goal might be all focused on product, right? We want to have this really robust community where um, we're getting a strong and consistent feedback loop on our product because we need to develop this product further and we don't have anybody using it, so that's the main mission. Or a third example might be just broad awareness, right? Like we're going to build this community because we want everybody in the world to know about our platform, our product, our API. And if you can focus the bulk of your program, especially early on, on one of those things and then measure just a couple metrics that are relevant to that goal, I think that, that really helps demystify and, and uh, make measurement less daunting. Plus one. <laughs> All plus one at two. Yeah. <laughs> plus three. <laughs> uh, do we find that DevRel usually reports into marketing or another group? And if it is marketing, is it product marketing? Um, what uh, has the panel seen be most successful mm -hmm. in organizations? So uh, I'll start. Um, when I first joined Cloudflare, I reported into marketing, but I currently report into the CTO. Um, and what I've found uh, as a major difference is who can unblock me when I need a thing to get done. Um, so just as an example, um, an engineer at Cloudflare had written uh, node bindings for the Cloudflare API. Um, now I need to assign this uh, person um, some time to uh, better document the code and write a blog post. Um, but that's up to their manager's approval, right? Um, the CTO can help me unblock that the way that a head of marketing would have to spend more time and more cycles making that happen. Um, likewise, uh, very often, you know, in a larger engineering driven organization, it's, someone will say like, I, I want such and such conference to be sponsored. Um, well, who has the budget to control that, right? Um, who is able to approve that? Um, where do, does the information need to travel up a tree and back down? Is it lateral? Like who has, to, who has the permissions to give the final approval? So uh, my, basically whoever can unblock your workflow the most effectively and in a, a lot of times as engineering, a lot of times people want to set the goals of DevRel to be similar to marketing goals. And so that's why a lot of DevRel programs put uh, DevRel under marketing. But over time you start to find like, okay, depending on what the goals of the program actually are, who ends up unblocking you the most? Mm -hmm. yeah, so. 
I think your, your business goals for the program will out with the organizational structure. I've variously been under product, engineering, marketing, sales, and also partnerships in different companies. And that was reflected in the type of work that we were expected to do. So at some places, at the place where it was in partnerships, DevRel was really um, the glue that was holding key partners into the platform. And so the primary focus of our days was making sure that top partners were successful. And that was the main goal of DevRel at that program. Um, in other places, it was growing top of funnel adoption. And so we were in marketing and we had goals that were tied to bringing people down the funnel of actually getting to a paid tier of our API. Um, and then inside product, a lot of our function, I'm, I'm, we're inside product at Slack. Um, a lot of what we do is work very closely with the product team on making sure that any changes we make to the product sit well with our, with our developers and that we're building things that are useful for the people who are building on our, on our platform, who are partners, but also not partners. So one of the cool things we did is uh, at a recent event, we had uh, our platform roadmap just printed out onto like a giant physical Trello board. And we had people add their own ideas, but we also gave them stickers to vote on things. And for every sticker that they said was high pry, they had also had to stick one that was low pry or medium pry. So we could see where things were shaking out and are we building the right things? And is our short term, medium term, long term matching up with what people intend? And so that's a very product DevRel org. Um, and hopefully it's not necessarily putting the cart before the horse to decide where where you go, because like Jade mm -hmm. said, it's where you go affects what you do, but also you should probably choose what you're going to do and then pick the organization accordingly. But it's, it's worked fine through, throughout all of those different places I've been, but DevRel does get reorged a lot as people's minds change. I don't know if you guys <laughs> experienced that, mm -hmm. but I've been through yeah. like yep. more reorgs than I have fingers, so. Yeah. But you know what? Reorgs actually uh, improve the um, effectiveness of organizations, yeah. often not because of uh, often not because of where people end up, but because reorganizations cause lateral connections to happen. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not uh, anti-reorg. Yeah. I'm just saying it happens a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, just to give the crowd, like, so you can make your own tallies, um, my experience has been mostly in, uh, in marketing organizations where the DevRel, uh, where, where the DevRel grew out of. And, but actually the last two companies uh, that I've been with, community has been the team under which developer relations lives, and community is its own thing within a company alongside engineering and product and sales and marketing. Um, and my my opinion, community, uh, you know, while it is defined as a group of people within the company, it also is like a mindset, and it should it should be infused throughout the organization. Um, but the people who are solely responsible for doing that infusing. Uh, fall into the community team and developer relations fall set under that. And, and you all's experience as, as managers or just as operators, like <clears throat> how do how do DevRel people uh, create leverage? Like how how do the best DevRel people get more done with less? Um, relationships. Relationships. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Really good at creating connections throughout the organization. Again, like that infusing the whole organization with this mindset uh, that happens by the people who are responsible and accountable for that piece of the business making, making building bridges throughout the organization. And, uh, and I, I guess I was assuming mm. that your leverage question was like internal leverage. Like how do you, like yeah, how do you get stuff done internally? I mean, you're, you're one person, mm. right? Like how many people can you meet? It could be... Getting more done with fewer people. Yeah, like, yeah. A, like what's, what's, the, what's a good, yeah. Well, yeah. another thing is like, um, you don't literally have to create every piece of content yourself from your yeah. team, right? Like someone writes a really good form post or a really good internal email, you could probably approach that person, whether they're from a product team or engineering or somewhere else and say like, hey, can we clean this up a little bit and turn that into a blog post? Mm -hmm. And if you have someone who's systematically like keeping their eye out for good content that's internal that can be repackaged for external use, like that's that's taking goods that were already created and making mm -hmm. that work product, yeah. right? And additionally, um, a lot of automation. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Ift has been super useful, <laughs> mm. um, and uh, Boomerang and uh, Streak and tools like that. 
So rather than you know remembering, uh, here is a bunch of people from uh, partner organizations that I need to contact. Well, I have Boomerang set to um, put this back into my inbox if no one has responded to this thread in two weeks. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. I heard a great phrase today, which is, it's okay to let balls drop as long as you tell people to move their feet out of the way. So <laughs> if you're really just one person, it's okay to cut scope. And it's okay to say, we're not going to be able to do these 15 events because I'm only one person and that's not where the, the highest impact is. We're going to focus on X, Y, and Z things and shop that around to make sure that people say, yeah, we agree. If, if you can only do these things, that's, that's where you're going to be. Um, and sometimes building up a DevRel org or a DevRel presence is, is a slow burn, and that's okay, just be upfront. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, and also people outside of your organization, yeah. Um, yeah. especially when you're uh, ecosystem building. Um, for instance, you know, an apps platform. Um, if you have uh, app authors who are writing apps on your platform, um, one thing that's been really useful is inviting them to give talks um, at your meetup, so that solves part of your content creation uh, burden, mm -hmm. right? And also, like, hey, I am totally happy to help an app author, you know, talk about their Cloudflare app at a conference. I'll like help you with your conference proposal. I'll like buy you a plane ticket if you want, right? Like <laughs> Spon the, sponsor. Yeah, like I, I will like give you a bunch of goodies too. You know, like. Yeah. <laughs> That, that's it's a very high leverage to do things like that and it also helps their career like for instance they might be a startup founder who wants to promote their product they might be a consulting shop that wants to get more gigs mm -hmm. like that helps them in every way yeah I'll say at the my experience has been at the other <coughs> end of the scale spectrum I guess once we were like a, a big team um, with a good presence Ambassador program is also a way to to get more out of um, out of the team that you pay and and have in house. Uh, creating an ambassador program for community members who have been super super engaged and you kind know, of bringing them along with you uh, for the ride. So at SendGrid, for example, we have one evangelist at an event with a thousand developers. They're not going to be able to really get the the high touch um, that we would that we would wish for. So bringing one or two ambassadors along with them and playing, paying for their plane ticket, making sure that all their expenses are paid um, and giving them a chance to be at the event that they wanted to be at anyway and wear the t-shirt and represent and learn from the people who are doing it professionally uh, is, there, is another thing. I do want to add though, leveraging your community is great, but it's not it's not not work. There's mm -hmm. so much work in managing a healthy yes. community, yeah. checking in with people, making sure that they understand any sort of obligation they have if they're part of a formalized program, making sure that they're happy, um, seeing that they don't churn out. That is a ton of work to manage. Yeah. So yeah. even having one person managing all that, that's a full-time job. So yes, using your community is great, but don't um, undersell to yourself the amount of time of yours it can suck if you really are a solo flyer. Uh, your work at Meteor uh, focused a lot on ambassadors and you had mm -hmm. a huge program that was mm -hmm. um, uh, really successful. And uh, we're asking if you could uh, just to expand on that a little bit. I started at Meteor as uh, like number five and um, so like very early on and at the time that I left we had uh, meetup groups in 100 cities worldwide. Um, that was about two years. Um, and basically every time someone, um, you know, an enthusiastic fan wanted to have a Meteor meetup group, I would create a meetup account and give them uh, all the permissions they needed and all of the stuff they needed, a kit to start a meetup group, um, and try to help get more uh, meetup organizers um, off the ground. And this created a system where um, inside the walls at Meteor, we were basically like the bone structure and they were all the boots on the ground. Um, and one thing you got to realize about like a gift economy is that they give of their own free volition. We also give back of our of what we can. And at every possible opportunity, we are also thinking about like um, the career paths of the meetup organizers, what we can do to help them, right? Because they are, you know, they are variously freelancers or uh, people who have their own consulting shops and build apps for clients, or they are code boot camp teachers, or they are like th they span, or they have a day job at another tech company. That they they span a wide range, and so there is something that's a lot like um, 
managing humans on your own team inside a company, except that a lot of the people who you are quasi-managing are outside of the company. Um, oh, and there is a previous heavy bit talk on the library where I go into this in a lot more detail. Is there like a moment where uh, the, the like everyone in the business is like, yes, this is a thing that we should invest in, or is it you just do it slowly? Um, as, as there's more work to be done? Well, one thing you should ask yourself and also uh, whoever you're reporting into um, and be ready for the answers is, if you had X more dollars, where would they go, like marginally speaking, right? Like if you had more people and more dollars, would you be doing more of some activity that you otherwise wouldn't have done and had the capacity for? Um, and if you have a bulleted list uh, with specifically estimates for what they will cost in the next year, that becomes a lot easier to justify um, basically moving forward. So like, yeah, we are sponsoring meetup groups, so, but we could do X number more conferences if I had Y more dollars is a very good thing to, like, as an exercise to tell yourself, like, okay, these are the things that I'm prioritizing right now, but I could do more of the other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think looking at the, the opportunity cost of not bringing on someone is a really good angle to a lens to view it through uh, in order to come up with that like when and, and why, uh, the answers to when and why. In some cases, the opportunity cost might be geographic opportunity, right? Where if we don't, have, if we don't hire someone uh, in Europe, for example, we're not going to capitalize on the already uh, burgeoning market there, like we already see that we have traction there, and there's this huge opportunity that could that could really be accelerated if we had someone on the ground there. Um, otherwise, you know, if there's a gap within the the current team that you have, right? If there's just not the talent or the skills present on the team that that you need to take the next step in achieving your goals, uh, putting in the the tactics that you're, the activities that you're not already doing. Um, and the people on, on, on staff already don't, don't possess those talents or skills or interests even, then you know, looking out to expand is, is a good re another good reason. Plus one. Oh. Another sort of tactical point is um, consider uh, the specific things that a, you know, what you're rate limiting in. Um, if it's getting packages packaged up and sent to meetup organizers and you simply don't have the human hours to s send all of those, um, consider external vendors. Like hour for hour, c external vendors are going to be a very good ROI for you. Um, specifically like, you know, companies that will, uh, there are companies out there that will print swag, put it in boxes, ship it to an address that you provide them where you give them a spreadsheet. Right, like there is we not customized a, notes. Yeah, yeah. And, and like handwritten notes or like put ribbons on it, whatever it is that you like specify. Um, there is no reason why you have to have a human living in the Bay Area, um, being paid <laughs> a Bay Area salary, right? When this could be done like anywhere in the world. I have packaged so many boxes with t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> It's yeah, I mean, like when, when, when you're doing like you know <laughs> yeah. five boxes, that's one thing. If you're doing like hundreds of boxes, external vendors all the way. Yeah. Have you all found any difference in in different markets um, like Asia and Europe? Mm -hmm. Is there uh, different tactics that work better in, in these markets? Are are they um, different enough? Do we just do you just run the the same game? So. Uh, so the media community was very uh, international, um, and one thing that I, um, I I had actually expected naively that there would be more overrepresentation in the Bay Area, but um, one thing that I had learned over time was um, you get different pockets of uh, different industries. Um, for instance, in London and also in Eastern Europe, we had a lot of uh, independent consulting shops who were making apps for clients. Um, whereas a lot of the uh, community in, say, Paris um, were people who uh, worked a day job else, like day job at a larger company and uh, 
happened to have a hobby side project that they were using Meteor for. You will find um, different developers depending on uh, the major industries that dominate the various cities that they live in. And so if they are in a if they are in a city where there are a lot of independent developers writing apps for clients, um, you different content will resonate with them better, right? Like content that's about you will ship faster and you will like, you know, make 20 apps in the time that it previously would have taken you like time to make seven or eight. Um, you will get more done with fewer people and reuse more of your code. Like that's a that's very different messaging from like um, here are things that you can do for your employer and start moving this inward in the company. Yeah, I've seen I've seen a lot of similarities in developer communities around the world um, in expanding the the team the developer relations team. I've always preferred to hire someone local someone who's part of the local community, and that has made a huge difference in terms of them, on, like our ability as a company and or as an organization to understand the local culture and the local norms. But I think like when it comes to Europe, for example, you could have an American you know, who relocates and does a great job uh, in the European market, and I think South America as well. Um, when it comes to like, Japan, for example, and in some other Asian countries, in my experience, it's like the language barrier is, is a much bigger deal. Um, in technology, generally, most people speak English, but um, I find that you can, you can build stronger relationships and, and build more trust and respect in those local communities if you have someone who does speak the local language also, and, and obviously that brings along with it uh, the culture and the norms and, and stuff as well. I think there's, a, there's tons of similarity and, and developers all over the world gravitate towards very similar activities and, and tactics and, uh, that, that any, any person could, could undertake or could put out there. It definitely like, really shows that you care and uh, are taking things seriously whenever you um, support the local economy and, and community by hiring, the, hiring people where you want to expand. Mm -hmm. I agree with both those things, and just to jump onto the, the language issue, um, sometimes you might not recognize that interacting with you face-to-face -face is actually kind of stressful, because if you are speaking to them in English and you haven't slowed down your pace of speech or you expect that they'll be able to speak back to you, a lot of people find that a lot more intimidating than interacting online. So the vibe of your meetup may be more read-only, where in uh, in the Bay Area, you might expect that this is where people spend, you know, 60% of the time networking, 40% of the time suffering through your talk, whatever. <laughs> and, <laughs> and in other markets, it's like they come for the talk and then maybe they stick around to socialize. And that's not necessarily a failed event. Right. Um, I have been at events. Um, we had a Twitter event in Japan where I don't think anyone spoke to me. Like I, I, I attempted and people just kind of like politely walked away, but then the Twitter feed was 2,000 tweets long over the course wow. of like three hours. So people were having these conversations, it was just not face-to-face. -face. Yeah. I think one more thing mm -hmm. to consider is like what's happening in the markets that you're, that you're considering expanding into. Um, India was a really interesting one for me because uh, you know, when I visited there the first time in 2012, there, wasn't, there weren't a lot of things happening. Mm -hmm. There weren't companies doing developer evangelism mm -hmm. and throwing on meetups and hackathons. And so being the company there from America that was doing that was like, it just generated tons and tons of love, you know? And, and I think so what, what's happening already in terms of in, in those markets, like what are the local companies providing for those communities? And also what are the interests? Like they're, uh, um, right now I've, I've kind of switched my focus to machine learning as, as the technology um, based on my employer. And I found in my research that like, that is a really, really popular uh, topic in India particularly. Um, so finding out you know, what's happening and what's hot and, and of interest in different markets is really helpful. I have two things to add to that. Um, so if you're trying to prioritize where to have in-person events based on uh, 
based on what you feel like is very little information, um, I recommend looking at your docs traffic. You will probably find that, like basically where you're getting uh, hotspots of where your docs traffic are, are going to be prime candidates for where you should hold your uh, first several meetups. Um, Naively, you might think that they just mirror uh, internet connectivity in the world, but they don't necessarily. Um, another thing is a cool factoid I recently learned and in retrospect seemed completely obvious. Um, Stack Overflow has a treasure trove of data on mm. who, like, population distribution of developers, who is using what stack where, <laughs> uh, just based on who is like answering and asking questions where. Oh. Um, and this has been used by companies in terms of like where to locate future offices and where they can find good hires. Mm. Um, that in retrospect, really of course they would have that information, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> Pro tip. We've talked a lot about how to work with individual developers or sell to individual developers, but how would our tactics change if we're selling to um, someone else in the organization that's not the developer, engineering yeah. manager, VP yeah. engineering? Yeah. So more of the, the, the purchasers, especially in larger organizations, mm -hmm. right? Um, in my experience, the it's a really nice compliment to have community building happening and relationships being being forged at both ends of that, right? Where you have a developer relations program that is getting in touch with the developers who will likely be doing the work and if they decide, if their manager decides to, to purchase this technology, um, while at the same time building building bridges to those managers. Um, so in, in my experience, work the, the way to do that is to really build internal connections with sales and maybe um, technical account managers, the, the people who are already going to, who are working with, with those types of people, interfacing with those types of people, um, either after the deal is closed or before the deal is closed, and supporting their work through the developer relations program, right? So an, uh, an advocate or an evangelist can very easily also take on responsibilities like sales engineering or solutions architecting. Um, so uh, allowing and opening up that, uh, that, that connectivity in, internally, so a person who's trying to sell to enterprise and needs, uh, needs some technical support on a sales call or a person who's working on partnerships with a big, big huge enterprise uh, and they need someone to, to really dig into the weeds of how that integration would work, like saying, hey, developer relations is, is here to support those teams as well, uh, really helps. Um, I want to add two things to that. One is um, interview, uh, just pick one or two examples of the buyer that you're trying to target and uh, interview them really thoroughly to understand like what makes them tick and what their uh, what the KPIs for their own job is, right? Like what it is that will make them uh, look good in terms of uh, to the rest of their company, um, and because you as a DevRel person are in close communication with the developer inside their company, make sure you give them really good ammo, right? Like talking points that they can bring upward. Um, that speak to specifically the KPIs that their boss is going to be measured for. Um, and then basically you will be doing that person a big favor because then they don't have to do the mental gymnastics or like they're not doing two steps of thinking, you're doing that on their behalf. There's uh, a common practice that you see um, with different pricing tiers, uh, which is there's often a developer plan uh, or like a pro plan that is uh, priced precisely where a developer's corporate Amex will, um, is like well within like what they are allowed to purchase. Fact of the matter is, they will probably just like swipe their credit card and integrate into the product and by the time their manager finds out, um, because they need um, the enterprise tier features, they're like, well, we could spend a couple of weeks shopping around <laughs> competitors or we could just push this button and because we have other <laughs> work to do. Um, like that happens more often than you might naively expect. <laughs> so things to, uh, have under consideration. <laughs> uh, at your various teams, what do you call these people? And how much do you pay them? 
I mean, to a large extent, it also dep it depends a lot on the stage of the company. Um, if they have just raised a Series A and they're very early stage, um, early stage startups have a tendency to give you uh, more stock and uh, less cash, and companies that are farther along tend to weigh that a little bit more the other way. Um, is, would you guys generally agree? Yes. And so yeah. uh, the salary ranges for early stage startups are going to look a little bit different from uh, later stage, more mature companies that are more stable. I want to give you a not cop-out answer, but I can't figure out how to do that in a way that's fair to my colleagues and to, to people on the teams. So I'm going to chew on that for a little bit, but if you have a better answer right now. Yeah. Um, I'll start with the first one, evangelist, advocate, developer relations, professional. Like I Personally, I, any of them work. Um, I've recently really, I've, I have an idea for a, a blog post that I haven't fully baked yet, but uh, the word developer friend is, is something that I like that because like, it's just straightforward um, because it kind of is what, what this person does, they're your friend. They, they help you, they support you, they care about what you're trying to achieve and they listen. I think it actually reveals your organization's attitude toward the role of DevRel. If you're okay. an evangelist, they expect you to be doing more outbound stuff. Okay. If you're an advocate, you've probably fought for the title with the expectation that you're going to be giving substantial product feedback and you're going to be more embedded in the product and engineering teams. Um, Phil Legger had this uh, DevRelometer, yeah. uh -huh. <laughs> if, you, if you just Google DevRelometer, you can check the boxes about what you do and it kind of tells you are you an advocate or evangelist based on whether the stuff that you're doing is primarily outbound or content creation, supporting developers, working with partners, that kind of thing. Um, so on my team right now, we call ourselves advocacy and within the team we have two people who are primarily focused on documentation writing, two people who are writing our SDKs and other developer tooling like a testing tool. Um, and then one and a half people where I'm the half time focused on doing broad outreach to people who are building internal integrations, we call them at Slack. It's like um, if you're writing an integration for just your Slack team, mm -hmm. and that's a whole other segment of, of developers who have different concerns and different needs, kind of in the, in the engineering manager segment where what they're looking for may be slightly different from the platform. Yeah. Um, and so all of us have some portion of documentation writing to do. All of us have some amount of code writing to do, and all of us have some outreach to do. Um, but within those sub teams, we kind of lean a little bit one way or another, so we still have clear lines of responsibility on who owns what. I absolutely mm -hmm. agree with that. Um, I think whenever I say there is no difference, I've, I, I guess that's more of an observation of, I, I, I see them used pretty um, liberally and and maybe without thought and I, th I hope that there's more of a of a conscious mindful decision making process around that and more and more organizations yeah. um, I've I guess so yeah I think advocacy being more like an internal role and uh, an evangelism being more outward spread the word um, makes a lot of sense to me yeah. um, I want to add that uh, on my team generally I uh, there are two archetypes. Um, one is a people person who is d doing a lot of the managing of volunteers in the community, the app authors who you know, we're leveraging to give talks, and uh, basically there's a lot of people-related tasks, right? And you want someone who is not going to get uh, socialed out. <laughs> um, and that is a different uh, core personality type um, and core skill set. Um, from someone who you want to lean on for a lot of technical writing and uh, basically like write technical talks, teach workshops, write code examples, uh, write technical documentation, write blog posts, um, help people debug their code when they have questions and figure out like product-wise what needs to happen so that uh, fewer people run into that problem in the future, right? So like the technical requirements of the second archetype are a lot, um, are a lot harder. So uh, in terms of like when you're structuring your program, one thing to keep in mind is like how many of each one of each archetype do you need? Do you, um, is it like one people person and three, uh, three hardcore more technical people? Or are you doing more like, or do you need like three people persons and like only one technical writer slash code writer? 
Um, and a lot of that's going to depend on uh, what you need to get out of your program and strategically like how you're going to achieve your goals, whether it's more leveraging of the external community versus um, versus uh, producing more content and things like that. You're a human load balancer. <laughs> I, I, I am currently uh, in the process of like becoming more of a human load balancer. <laughs> goals for the DevRel goals. program? Mm. Goals for the DevRel program, yeah. Yeah, uh, I could share one uh, example of a goal. Um, so at Meteor, um, if you so if you install Meteor and you're typing Meteor into the command line, one of the things that it does is check to see if it's running the most recent version. Um, that also means that uh, the server that's serving the updates uh, gets a ping, um, and we found that that was a really you know really reliable indicator of active development. <laughs> So, uh, because you're literally typing Meteor into the command line. So, number of those uh, pings over time, uh, whether the time window is a day or per week or per month, um, that was a really good needle. And a goal could be like X percent month over month growth of uh, people typing Meteor into the command line. Um, and the leading indicator prior to that is usually docs traffic. With docs traffic, it might be a lot harder to say like X percent month over month growth, um, in part because, I mean, both of these things both undercount and over, both under and overcount, especially because you don't want to be too creepy because that will turn off developers. Um, but a, a person who is uh, developing from home and uh, at their office will show up twice and multiple people developing in the same office will show up as show up once. So, but generally speaking, that number will go up and down together with your active development. So those are two uh, fairly reasonable metrics. So for high level goals, I like to think about um, adoption, retention, and satisfaction as being the, the primary pillars that we're serving in DevRel. Um, and in my team, I try to be careful not to conflate a statement of work done with the goal you're trying to achieve. So if the goal is retention um, and you think that keeping CSAT high in, across your platform is going to help people be retained, um, your statement of work might be like, we're going to do this many community love uh, events or whatever it is with the understanding that that builds toward your CSAT number. Um, but having just a number of events or like uh, trying to think like this many tutorials that we're going to write this month or we're going to expand our tooling by X amount is not always a great goal because it's just a uh, output measured rather than net effect. So some of the things that we're always looking at high level are going back to, all right, is this serving into adoption, into retention, or into satisfaction? And then each of those can be measured. Um, each of your work done out of that can be measured in service of those goals. You used a very similar model uh, that um, one other goal w in addition to that would be just um, activation. Once they've adopted the the, uh, the API or the product, then how much are they using it? So just increasing usage. And um, I guess one, one metric that I'll throw out there th th uh, related to that that I think is um, important, especially if the developer relations program is responsible for uh, API clients or libraries, is measuring <coughs> uh, to, to, to measure success around which of those libraries are being used and which, which languages are most being used to, to connect to the API and what's the revenue that comes out of that usage. Uh, so if you have a different library in six or seven different languages, uh, being able to track, you know, where those are being used, how much they're being used, and where that tracks to the to the business bottom line. That's good. Another one is a uh, number of apps submitted to uh, number of apps submitted for moderation for and uh, for your apps platform is another reasonable one that's uh, at the end point. And doing consulting and, and coming to opportunities where. Uh, no one's no one's really responsible for goal setting. They they know they want a thing, but they don't know what they want delivered. I guess, and who should be responsible in those cases? 
you. You, <laughs> you. Yeah, because at the 100%. end of the day, you're you. going to be delivering them something that something <laughs> and you should sell them early on on the idea of like this is what you need and here's why i mean if you have that opportunity to do that definition amazing go ahead and, and grab it that's a lot of freedom to work with and that's mm -hmm. um that's actually kind of great rather than having a client come to you and saying like here's exactly what you want and if you don't meet these standards we're going to be dissatisfied i mean this is another place where the entrepreneurial mindset um comes in really handy right um i think it's very useful to uh, go as high level as you can and say, and come to an understanding with, you know, the founders of the company or the top executive that you're working with. Um, what are the, what are the like quarterly and like yearly goals for that company, right? And how does your work fit into that? And like have kind of an understanding of how those things are related. Um, and then you tell them like, okay, I've thought about what your company's goals are. Um, here's what I think the program should be and here's what the goals of the program should be if they are not defining it for you. So the, the question here is for Jade uh, about her work at Meteor and how she rewarded this network of ambassadors that, uh, that was created. Um, well, uh, in, I would say, let's see. I, I wouldn't really call anything tricks. <laughs> um, so they were often invited to uh, exclusive events. Um, we had a lot of one-on-one -on -one contact. So in some sense, I feel like I am personal friends with them. And if they had a question about something, um, I could get them core dev time, um, which is something that is hard to come by if you're a random person. A lot of times the meetup organizers who are the, the captains of the meetup groups um, are seen as experts in the community that they are managing in their own city. And um, that's a really good boost of confidence for them. It also positions them as, I mean, as an expert. Um, it also means that because they are in close communications with me all the time, um, they are getting some information before it is officially announced. Um, and that is often, like, they get to try new things. And <laughs> so is there a company that we look up to that has done DevRel that we, I guess none of us have worked at before? <laughs> uh, I, th I think um, Pivotal has done DevRel really well, even if they, I don't think they've even ever had like a DevRel team, but they're just so like hardcore developer focused and they create such good content um, that I, I really look up to them as a pretty awesome example of great developer relations, developer focus. Uh, just the other day I met Caitlin from Stack Overflow, um, built the DevRel program from scratch. Um, yeah, the, they, they've done a great job. Um, in part, like, in, in a lot of times, uh, there will be companies that have a developer-facing product, and it's only it's kind of a small facet of everything that they do. But in their case, that's their that is their audience. Period. <laughs> um, Twilio and Stripe, they've both put in a lot of work into creating a great developer experience end to end. Hat tip, Roma, um, and that is all the difference it makes when you log into their developer portal and it's a slick experience when the API is painless to use, that I think is as much a part of doing DevRel right as going out and building a great community. Yeah, Twilio is the one that comes to mind for me and I think that's probably maybe an obvious answer for a lot of people in the room, but I'm just uh, having seen it from its formative stages in you know, 2009, 2010 to what they are now. It's, it, it started with a very, very, very uh, thoughtful and uh, professional approach, and it's only gotten better. Great. I think that's a, that's a wrap for this evening's conversation about developer relations. Hope it was a good experience. Thanks to <laughs> attendees. Thank